Good morning, everyone. Uh, just a few announcements before we get started. The youth are meeting tonight at 6 at the church. Um, you need to be here. We're finishing our planning for Youth Sunday, which is next week. So if you want to part in one of the skits or uh, I want to say in the service, that's we're going to be planning that tonight at 6 o'clock. Uh, also, Bible study is this Wednesday at 6 o'clock. Bring a covered dish to share, and uh, we will be continuing on in our series on the Holy Spirit. Uh, also, Operation Christmas Child Shoe Boxes, they have moved. They are back there uh, above the, the stairs. Uh, you can pick them up. Um, shoe boxes this year are $9 to ship. There's no toothpaste or candy allowed. That seems depressing to me, but... Uh, uh, I guess you don't need as much toothpaste if you don't send the candy, I guess. So, but uh, uh, boxes are due November 12th, so we'll be gathering those up uh, for that uh, time. And you can even start uh, filling them up and bring them in, and we'll keep them on the front pews here. Uh, also, thank you to everyone who uh, served on the 175th committee and everyone who volunteered last week. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we... We pulled it off, and it was only it only took about a year and a half to plan. So, uh, thank everyone who uh, pitched in and helped out. Uh, also, newsletter items to Kim by this Wednesday, and then next Sunday night uh, we will be having our trunk or treat event uh, out here in the church parking lot. Uh, at three o'clock, we're going to be showing the Great Pumpkin Charlie Brown uh, for the kids while the adults are out getting their trunks uh, prepared and ready and uh, for the the evening. Uh, then we'll have the trunk or treating at 3.30. Uh, we'll have costume judging at 4 o'clock. And then 4.30 we'll have a covered dish dinner. Uh, and then uh, this year we'll be having game night after following the, the, the dinner. So bring your favorite board game or video game or whatever game you have that you'd like to play. And we'll be uh, uh, doing that. So that'll be this Sunday, this next Sunday coming up, October 29th. So we hope to, to see everyone out for, for that. Uh, also, uh, there is still some 175th uh, anniversary merchandise that's moved back to this back table. So if you would like to, to uh, purchase any of that, uh, you can do that. It's just moved. And also, uh, we have quite a few bulletins left from last week. They are in back uh, where you come in. I know a lot of people like to save those from the previous time. So if you would like an extra one of those, just feel free to grab one and, and take it with you. Does anyone else have any other announcements this morning? All right, let's open with a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for today. And Lord, we thank you that uh, we can come and we can worship in your house together as your body. And Lord, we thank you for what you blessed us with last week. And Lord, we just ask uh, that you bless us once again this week with your presence, with the uh, uh, wisdom from your word, Lord, with uh, our worship time together. Father, just have your way in this place, in this time. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Let's go ahead and stand here this morning. Now, Margaret came to me last week and she's like, Sean, why do you even play my songs? Well, Doug's been picking the songs out for the last year. I haven't been picking them out. So, if you have a song that you want us to sing here in church, just tell me and Doug and we'll, we'll play it for you. But this is a great old hymn that uh, I never would have probably been introduced if it wasn't for her singing to me. Oh, no. I 
God's family line Just a fight for the week through Calvary's love All we're sending is mine And the transaction so quickly was made When as a sinner I came Took all the offer of grace he did offer He saved me, oh praise this day
Let's go ahead and stand in worship.
services for eight out of ten days that they had special services for the hundredth uh, anniversary. I can't even imagine uh, 
And they say, no, nothing's changed. Those people must have been tougher because I was dead <laughs> after three days, two days of services and a day of a picnic. So, but uh, yes, it was wonderful. I saw a hand. Yes, Lori. Okay. Anyone else have a praise? Yes, Jerry. Ten years. All right. How about the prayer request? Um, anybody have a, a prayer request this week? Yes, Janelle.
uh, knee surgery and Caleb who may need some back surgery. Lord, we just uh, ask you to, to touch them and be with the doctors as they perform these procedures. Lord, Lord we think of this uh, Kyle Latoro who is uh, injured in the football game. Lord, we just pray for a speedy recovery and Lord that you would continue to have your healing hand upon uh, uh, him. And Lord, for Jean Bauer Socks and her memory, Lord, we just... Uh, are uh, asking you to, to just allow it to remain strong and Lord that you bring back some of the, the memory issues that she's been having Lord we also uh, think of Janelle's grandfather who was in this accident Lord we were asking for you to uh, uh, just uh, allow uh, uh, this asthma not to, to have any more problems and Lord for healing from this heart attack Lord we just uh, uh, lift him up to you and Lord for Brock Roy as he's uh, battling leukemia Lord we uh, uh, just to pray that you would uh, just put your hand in this situation and intervene, Lord. Uh, uh, we are just praying for him, that you would strengthen him. And Lord, for Gloria, the teach sister, Lord, we just lift her up. And Lauren, as she goes for, for teaching uh, this week, and, and Jerry, uh, as he uh, uh, goes on Thursday, Lord, we're just asking for you to be real to them, Lord, that you would be present in all of these situations. And Father God, that you would... I bring healing where healing is needed. You bring strength where strength is needed. Uh, you bring wisdom where wisdom is needed. And Father God, we just thank you and praise you for what you're going to do. And we lift up all of these unspoken requests uh, to you as well. And we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, this time the children are dismissed to Children's Church. did enjoy themselves uh, last weekend. Uh, the, we had some wonderful services here and some wonderful times here and um, I had a cheap weekend so the food was incredible, uh, especially the many pieces of pie that I had over the weekend. They were all good. Uh, I got to meet some people that have been uh, a part of this church in the past that I hadn't got to meet before and uh, the services were powerful. I got a lot of feedback, especially from all of you that gave testimonies. Uh, they thought that that was uh, incredibly impactful. Uh, the times of fellowship um, and uh, the Holy Spirit was here with us. And uh, these aren't just my opinions. These are all things that over the week people have commented to me that they enjoyed about uh, the weekend. And, and, and as Sunday night rolled around, I have to admit, I felt my age. I was exhausted and I slept from 10 p.m. on Sunday night until 9 a.m. on Monday morning. Um, I was shooting for 12 hours, but I only got 11 in. But uh, it, was, uh, it, was, it was good. And, so, and on Monday morning, I, I woke up and I was feeling really good from the weekend and my spirits were high. And then uh, I got on the computer and opened up Facebook and uh, I saw that people had posted pictures and videos and people were commenting on them and so I was looking through the, the different things and, and then this showed up. Apparently someone was not very happy about our balloon release. Uh, so uh, they decided to post a link to www.balloonsblow.com and gave 21 reasons why the kill, balloon release is killing animals and the environment. And uh, so I did. I took it all in stride. I said, okay, you know, we knew this may be an issue, so we bought special biodegradable balloons. I mean, we went to the trouble, and so I, I commented back to the person. I said, thank you for your concern. I said, we use environmentally friendly balloons. And they're biodegradable, so thank you for your concern. To which they responded by sending the exact same link and sending us 10 alternatives for, safer alternatives for instead of a balloon release. And that no balloon biodegrades instantaneously and we were, we were using up the world's resources of helium. <laughs> you can't make it up. Well, now I'm starting to get upset. 
And so I'm like, I don't even know who this person is. Were they here? And so I, I did some Facebook stalking and I was on their page and, and, and it's a person, you know, I don't know. They're not originally from here. They may be here now, but uh, I, I'm like, okay, right, I'm going to let them have it. Just let us have our parade. Don't rain on it, okay? Just let us have our parade. And so I began searching the internet for resources to back up. We are not running out of helium. Stop <laughs> And as this was happening and I was frantically looking for things to say, a voice in the back of my head said, just let it go. Just let it go. Is this person worth ruining your whole day? So I dropped it and went on my merry way. You know, later on in the week, I read a quote and it applies directly to the story. It says this. It says, everything can be taken from a man but one thing. To choose one's attitude in any set of circumstances. To choose one's way. Let me read that again. Everything can be taken from a man but one thing. To choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances. To choose one's way. That spoke directly to me, but it began speaking louder when I read who was the author of that quote. That quote came from concentration camp survivor Viktor Frankl. Now you think of the days that he must have went through. This was just a temporary annoyance at someone being ridiculous that I was dealing with. But even enduring the concentration camp, he says, you know what, they can never choose, they can never take away how I choose to control my attitude, my thoughts. But so many times, we do allow other people to control our attitude, don't we? Anybody else here ever have your attitude changed by a, a quick glance from a spouse? Or a quick word from someone that at work that is always getting a quick word in? Or we allow someone that we're close to to just grade on us and we're having a great day and all they need to do is one thing and then our day is ruined. Yes? But you know something? When we allow them to change our attitude, to change our thoughts, we're giving that other person a power that is not theirs. Because they don't have the power to change our attitudes unless we let them. We are the ones that are responsible. And because of the Holy Spirit as Christians, we have power over our thoughts. We have self-control. We don't like to talk about that. Uh, but we have a supernatural self-control that allows us to control our attitudes and our thoughts. And so we can walk away from these situations without them getting the best of us. And as Christians, this is absolutely essential. Because we're to be at peace with everyone. We're to be unified with everyone in the body. And so the Apostle Paul writes about what our attitude should look like to the church in Philippi. And, and if you have your Bible, I want you to turn to Philippians chapter 2. And we're going to be reading verses 1 through 11. Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. And it says this. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from His love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain, vain conceit, Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interest of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset or attitude as Jesus Christ, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of the servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself 
by, coming, by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. So we talked a little bit last week about how Paul's aim for the church is to be unified and bonded together through love and through compassion and through the Holy Spirit. But in order for that to happen, we have to get a few things right in our lives first. So many times we get the order wrong, though. We like to point the finger at, this is what this person needs to do in order for the body to be unified. Or, this is what this person needs to do. And Paul says, you need to determine what you need to do, what I need to do first, before we point the finger somewhere else. If we're going to achieve unity quicker, and stronger than ever before. So before we find out what we need to do, let's uh, ask the Lord to, to, to bless our time. Ed, could you open us with a word of prayer this morning? <clears throat> Father, we thank you for the blessings of this day. We, have, we ask, Lord, that you uh, watch over us during the sermon, uh, open up the study, open our hearts, open our minds, uh, help us to uh, hear, help us to heed, and uh, especially uh, bless pastors who delivers your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So the first thing that I see from the scripture is that in order to achieve this unity, we have to each individually get rid of our selfish ambition and our vain conceit. Now, Noah is a great lover of football. He loves everything to do with football. In fact, he's going up to the punt pass and kick this afternoon to in Clarion to compete, and he is just excited. And even when it's not football season, it's football season for Noah. And uh, in the summertime, he just sits there from the time he gets up and he turns on the old Big Ten Network games and the old SE, and he watches two teams that he could care less about from the 80s play football for a couple hours, and he just, he just enjoys the game. And he's always wanting to go outside and throw football and play quite a bit. And, and even though he's not even officially old enough to play until, until next, next football season, he just can't wait to start. However, he's soon to be seven. He's turned seven next week. Okay, I got another week yet. And the only problem with him is that he thinks he knows everything about the game already. Do you ever have a child that thought they were experts at everything? And he thinks he's already the greatest person to ever play the game. Okay. Last week during the Steeler game, he turned to me and he said, he said, if I were playing quarterback instead of Ben Roethlisberger, I'd have run for a touchdown instead of throwing that incomplete pass. Okay. You're seven, right? You've never played a down of football in your life. And so I just shook my head and told him, I said, man, you're in for a rude awakening the first time someone tackles you. You're going to go to the ground and you're going to say, what just happened? No one can stop me. But his love and his passion can sometimes lead to a confidence and a pride in something that comes that's unfounded. If that pride is left and kept unchecked, that it, 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 it just it becomes arrogance. It becomes conceit, conceitiousness. And so, I know who the boy's father is. And so, I, I know what genes are in him, and I know what to look out for in him. And so, it's something that he's going to have to watch out for. Now, we know that Paul loves this church in Philippi, and he's constantly building them up and, and praising them and saying good things. But he also wants to keep something in check. And so this is how he starts off. The, he says, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. 
Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. So what Paul is saying here is that even the, the, the people, the members of this church that he loves so much need to be on the lookout for two things. And we have to look at the original meaning of these words to get a little, uh, uh, to see what we're talking about. The Greek word used here for selfish ambition literally means a mercenary who acts for their own gain. So this is someone who comes to church only for what they can get out of it. They come to church because it benefits them in some way or they like the music or it's free child care for an hour. You know, we've all been there. Just take my kids. All right. But we, these kind of people only are involved in church as long as it's benefiting them. And they only act out of their own interests. This refers to someone who serves only God when it rewards them or benefits them. And this is the type of person who can get upset at the drop of a hat whenever we change the style of music or whenever the sermon goes too long or, or whenever something is out of order in the order of service. Because that's the danger when we serve out of selfish ambition instead of, of coming here and saying, I didn't really get anything out of today, but I can see that this family, this family's getting something out of it, or this person's getting something out of it. This is a dangerous place to be, and it stands in the face of church unity. It's the exact opposite. But selfish ambition isn't the only thing. It also tells us that we need to get rid of vain conceit. And this talks of a, a state of pride that is without basis or without justification. Uh, I had a conversation with a Christian who, uh, in, in, in two sentences, um, the first sentence they condemned someone because they had committed a certain sin. And then in the second sentence they cussed on church property. Uh, now, hello, it's reminding me of what it tells us that in Isaiah that our righteous acts are as filthy rags before the Lord. It's saying the best that we can do is to be a dirty rag before God. So why is that important? Because any time where we start to feel good or we start to feel pride in ourselves, we have to realize that, that, that that's vain conceit. The only good stuff that is in me comes from God because He's the only one who is good. He is the reason that we're worthy of anything. So we cannot allow ourselves to think more highly than we ought to where we are in our Christian walk or, or else that's another thing that can ruin the balance of unity. I want you to turn to your neighbor and tell them without Jesus, you're no big deal. So we have to get rid of selfish ambition and vain conceit in our lives, in ourselves first. And then when we do that, that paves the way to looking out for the interests of others first. Here's what it says in our scripture. It says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. How many of you think that that's impossible? It's really hard to look past your own self-interest sometimes, isn't it? To, to say, okay, I value this person more than, than, than myself. But it happens from time to time. Think about, guys, how you changed your behavior to make a date or a spouse happy. Where you would have rather have done this thing but you did this thing instead because they wanted to do it. I still remember I was out with a girl one time and we went to the movies and uh, 
I wanted to see The Water Boy. Adam Sandler movie. Perfect movie. Awesome. She wanted to see the remake of The Wizard of Oz. I had seen The Wizard of Oz. I hadn't seen The Water Boy. Guess what movie we saw? The Wizard of Oz. It was wonderful. But a behavior was changed because there was a motivation on the other end of wanting, there was a reason to change and to put someone else's opinion above yourself. Women, think about what you have given up for your kids' sake. How many times you've eaten a cold plate of food or how many times that you've given up uh, putting yourself together to get all the kids around. How many days you went without showers? I don't want to hear the number. <laughs> how much sleep you lost in order to make sure your kids had the best day ever. Has that happened? Yes. Or how about the things that you sacrifice to please your boss or to get that promotion or at your job or doing that job you hated to do just so that you could get a better one later. You know, you do these things. But we don't want them just to be the exception. What Jesus calls us to is to make these the rule where we put others first. And our motivation is this. I gave you heaven. I gave you eternal life. I gave you my son so that you would put others first. See, this is no small hurdle and it can't happen out of order and it can't happen at all until we get out the, the selfish ambition, the vain conceit, and then we have to get them completely out Allow the Holy Spirit to command us to move around the furniture inside of us. And then maybe we can choose to humble ourselves. The Holy Spirit will change our attitudes. The Holy Spirit will cause us to put other people first. See, this will be a constant battle. There's always going to be those that try to tear at you, that try to jab your attitude. And you can't allow them to win. Because your witness is at stake. Your identity as a Christian is at stake. The gospel is at stake. So each day you put on humility and you don't let the world undress you. The Holy Spirit will make that happen. So we must look to the interests of others first. And lastly, we must take on the attitude of humility that is modeled in Jesus Christ. You know, I was reading a, an account of, of Booker T. Washington, and he was a, a, a renowned black educator. And, and he was known as being an example of humility and selflessness. And, and shortly after he took the job of being president of the Tuskegee Institute in Alabama, he was walking in an exclusive part of town. And, uh, and, and so... He was stopped in the exclusive part of town by a wealthy white woman. And uh, she did not recognize him. She did not know him. And so she turned to him and asked him, she said, Would you like to earn a few dollars by chopping wood for me? Think of what would happen if this would happen today. A wealthy white woman asked, asking a college professor, a president of a university, to chop wood. So, Professor Washington reacted this way. He smiled, rolled up his sleeves, and proceeded to go to her house and chop wood. And when he was finished, he carried the logs into the house and sat them by the fireplace. And when they were in there, there was a young child who recognized him by sight. And she told lady after, after, the lady after he left who he was. Well, the next morning, the embarrassed woman went to see Mr. Washington in his office and apologized profusely. And he said this. He said, it's perfectly all right, madam. Occasionally, I enjoy a little manual labor. Besides, it's always a delight to do something for a friend. She shook his hand warmly. She assured him that his attitude, 
had endeared him and his work to her heart, and not long afterward she showed her admiration by uh, joining together a group of wealthy acquaintances to donate thousands of dollars to the Tuskegee Institute. I can't even imagine if someone stopped Al Sharpton on the, on the road and asked him to cut their wood for him. Amen? <laughs> and I can't help but think that it'd be impossible for someone in Mr. Washington's shoes not to take offense at, at what she would ask him to do, no matter what his skin color was, especially in that day and era. But he didn't take offense. He humbly did what was asked of him, despite what his stature was. And he was an example of humility and having the right attitude and what it can do. But it does not even come close to what Jesus did for you and me. Listen to our scripture again. It says, in your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. So I want you to think about what Jesus gave up. Jesus was at the right hand of the Father in perfection and chose to come down into this messed up world because he knew it was the only way that we could be saved. How many of you are leaving heaven to come back to earth to save anybody? Once I'm there, I want to be there, okay? And when he came, Jesus in his time here did not consider equality with God something to use to his advantage. Why is that a big deal? Because he was God. Jesus was God, and so he, but he chose to give up his, his deity to show us the way to humility. Jesus at any time could have pulled out the God card and said, nope, I'm not doing that. God card. I don't have to do that. I'm God. And do you realize that Jesus had to give death permission to take him. He had to say, okay, death, you can come get me. Because he was God. He was eternal. He was unkillable. But for us, he says, okay, I'm going to allow death to take me for your sake. Jesus was God and is God and forever will be God. He had every right and every power at his disposal to make his God side known. And yet, when the time came, he humbled himself. You know, we just think that we're God. We act like we're God sometimes, don't we? We think that we're the center of the universe and we're the only ones that can be right. And when someone goes against what we know and want, we play our God card and we throw a fit. No, that can't be the way. But we're not God. We're not even a God with a small g. Pride makes us delusional. Sin has always been the same. The snake went to Eve and he said what? You can be like God. And it was a lie then and it's a lie now. We can be carriers of God within us, but we cannot be God. So we follow the example of Jesus. We learn how to be humble in our attitude. And we go through this life putting the needs of others above our own. You know, Leonard Bernstein, the director of the New York Philharmonic, was one of the greatest uh, people to ever be in the music industry. The New York Times called him 
one of the most talented and successful musicians in American history. He was asked what, one time, what's the most difficult instrument to play? And he responded, the second fiddle. I can get plenty of first violinists, but to find someone who can play the second fiddle with enthusiasm, that's a problem. President Harry Truman put it this way, he said, it's amazing what you can accomplish if you do not care who gets the credit. You see, God is not out there looking for superstars. He's not looking for those who are smart enough or, or wise enough or those who are, are talented enough. Because He's already the bright and morning star. He will do all of the shining. What He's looking for are people who will, will put their egos and will put their pride and their attitudes aside so that He can use them to reflect His shine. And this will also make the church and, and the Christians in that come together in a way that we can't even understand. Unified for a common purpose. We need to get the me, myself, and I out of Christianity. And we do that by giving up our selfish ambition, our vain conceit. We do that by putting others in front of ourselves. And we do that by taking on the attitude of Jesus and being humble at all times. And if we do these things, we'll see a unified church that can accomplish anything it puts its mind to. Would you pray with me? Lord, we thank you for your word. And Lord, I, I just pray that we can put all pride and all arrogance and all of that aside and hear what you are telling us. Lord, you're showing us the best way to go. You're telling us through your word the best way to go. And so, Lord, I pray that we would take that seriously. If we take a close look at our pride and our, 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 our arrogance and, and, Father, that we would take it out and replace it with your Holy Spirit and your humility. Lord, may we have the same attitude as Jesus Christ in the church. And it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Let's go and stand and worship. Lord, I come, I confess, I will be Without you, I fall apart. You're the one that's my heart. Lord, I need you. Oh, I